I've talked a little bit about ritualism on the channel before, summarizing that they are a faith famous for basically not agreeing on pretty much anything regarding their faith or belief system. Ritualism, because of its fractured nature, is not considered a defined faith, but rather a blanket term for a collection of regional belief systems. It is the oldest continuously practiced faith system in the known world, and at its core, revere the 1001 steps of Sophocus. The reverence of it usually is the only thing that these sects happen to agree on, the steps usually referring to a great stairway of limestone and brick, and Sophocus the massive and inert ancient tower they were built upon. Now when I say massive, I did the quick math here because in a second I'm basically going to describe that each of these steps are about man size. These towers would be almost 6,000 feet tall at a rough estimate, so just to give you some perspective on how absolutely enormous these things are. Pilgrimage to the steps is not only encouraged but expected of many ritualists as it represents the pinnacle of their belief system on their path to spiritual actualization. It is said that the steps were originally climbed by a group of 100 100 pilgrims who journeyed to the top at the call of angels. After climbing a step each the height of a full-grown man, remember I said that before, the pilgrims encountered a trial and were taught a lesson by the angels to take with them as they continued their ascent. That is why when you look at the symbol for ritualism, it is a book with wings, a nod to both the angel and their lessons. For many long years, ritualism dominated Ceridon and was a core part of the empire of Ceridon's power structure, though this empire would falter by the 3rd century IS and devolve into a broken land ruled by warlords who would eventually be overthrown by the ward knights during the millennia spanning war in heaven. Since there are 17 subfaiths in the ritualism belief system, a system which already has trouble agreeing on anything, there are bound to be many differences and references within each. I will do my best to include as much context or lore as necessary when applicable, and although there are a lot of these subfaiths, not all of them have a terrible amount of lore attributed to them. So. If some of them sound brief, well, it's because that's all I got. Anyway, our first sub-faith is the Atabe Zatane, who worshipped the ritualist prophet Zatane, who, at just 17 years old, received a revelation from Sophocus. He preached that Wardenites were the arch enemy of Sophocus, and that they and all those who opposed ritualism should be eradicated as enemies of mankind. They believe that all other faiths are merely perversions of ritualism and must be assimilated for the sake of humanity or be purged. Zatane was one of the youngest ritualist prophets in history and hid himself away at age 19, promising to return when his people needed him most as he studied the occult. They also incorporated beliefs of the Sulemania sect, chiefly the belief in Doma Dani Yal, which I will talk about in the Sulemani section. Their core tenets are unrelenting faith, esotericism, and ritual hospitality. In the past, I've also read the virtues on these videos, but I feel like it just adds unnecessary time, so I'm just gonna let you look at them on the screen. That is what they have. They are a fundamentalist faith, as well as theocratic. Now, as for their tenets, we've already talked about unrelenting faith before. That basically just means that they are secure in their belief system and that they believe in it to the most high degree, which makes sense considering how zealous they seem to be from their brief description. They worship esotericism, which means the great mysteries of the divine may be beyond mortal comprehension. That is not an excuse for ignorance. They basically seek it no matter the cost essentially just seek truth. And ritual hospitality is hospitality is one of the greatest virtues mankind can exhibit. Guests in our home, be they mortal or divine, should always be treated with the utmost honor and respect. A lot of ritualist sects believe in the, um, what do you call it? They're like guest laws or hospitality laws, basically. Like if somebody comes in your home, you can't do harm to them. So that's essentially what that means. They worship the holy sites of Sophocus, which we've already talked about. It's this tower, Adubin's glory, which was the site of a ritualist warlords near death blow to the ward knights during the war in heaven. And the great library, which is fairly self-explanatory. It's a giant library that has been around for a very long time and is quite beautiful. And since these are the holy sites of all but a couple of the ritualist fates, I'll refrain from mentioning them unless there's a change, kind of like what I did with the life path video. But really there's not a whole to say about the three of them. These are fairly self-explanatory, unlike a lot of the other ones where I feel like I have to give a lot of context. A great library is like a great library. Adubin's glory is the only one that's a little bit weird, but we don't really need to talk about that too much. Anyway, for the next one, and for quite a few of these, if the name is really long, I'm just going to read it in its translated name just because that'll make it easier on myself. So next we have the Fraternity of Will Manifest. They believe reality is a collective hallucination and that true reality exists in the spiritual plane. Humans by extension are not beings of flesh, but are immortal and immaterial beings of spirit, eternal but finite, and that they have been trapped in the physical plane due to the deceits of a being known as al Qadir Rouge, but may break free of their bondage through the wisdom of Sophocus. Their core tenets are Anikonism, Gnosticism, and Esotericism. Anikonism means the worship of graven images has blinded far too many to the divine truth. We could cast all icons out of our holy places so that our faithful will not fall into that trap. Basically, they don't worship idols, probably because they don't see a point if they're spiritual beings there'd be no reason for them to worship anything physical, and they are Gnostic, 
strength, through knowledge, the divine spark that rests inside all humans may be liberated and returned to its heavenly source in the spirit realm. Pretty much a perfect one-for-one one example of their belief system. We've already talked about esotericism. They're also pluralists, and they are also theocratic. Their holy sites are the same as the ones I mentioned before. Third ritualist sect, the Korkatarkana, I hope I said that right, are all the way over in the Pirate Coast and are the ritualists who fled Saradon during the war in heaven and made their way over there, where they founded the prosperous, roughly 500 years spanning kingdom of Ufalorachi. They believe that only the greatest of believers can hope to climb Sophocus. Therefore, each follower strives to be greater than the last, as if in competition with each other to see who will be worthy of the climb. I'll go into more depth about this sect in a future video, so don't worry, if the Ufalorachi kingdom sounds interesting to you, we're going to cover it soon. The core tenets are esotericism, ritual celebration, and viargaric syncreticism. Esotericism, we've already talked about ritual celebration. I'm pretty sure you can figure that one out. But viargaric syncreticism is a unique one. We believe that all things in the world are cyclical and that the world rewards ambition, which sort of plays into their main belief system, much like the viargaric faiths of the Pirate Coast, which are the dominating faiths in that region. They do have a unique holy site in the Silver Palace remains on top of all the other ones that we've talked about. The Silver Palace was the site or basically the seat of the rulers of the Ufalarachi kingdom for a long time. Basically this huge, beautiful, palace. It was torn down in a pirate raid that basically ended the kingdom. They had already been falling apart for a while. We'll talk about this more next week, but that's just sort of a basic overview. There was this 500 year kingdom. It fell apart. The palace got stripped. So now it's just ruins. You can actually rebuild them in game if you play as the ritualist or really anybody, I think. But it costs a lot of money. Our next sect are the slaves of the Grey Worm, who worship an entity known as the World Eater, which was a giant worm-like creature that appeared in 144 IS. It was so large it could swallow entire cities. Horrifying. For 10 years, it devoured Ceridon, causing total catastrophe and a cultural reset until it was slain by Queen Redia Udayir in the eastern sands where its bones can still be seen in the boneyard. This sect believes that the world eater before they died spawned thousands of similar worms beneath the sands of Ceridon, which they appease by providing sacrifices for, lest the worms awaken from their deep slumber and rise once more to the surface. Pretty metal. Also very, very, very much Dune inspired. They believe in pastoral isolation, human sacrifice, and the sanctity of nature. This was one of the few where I don't think I need to explain any of these. We talked about pastoral isolation before. They want to be left alone and they want to farm. Human sacrifice, that's self-evident. They find that as a holy tenet and they obviously do for a reason. And the sanctity of nature, again, it makes sense that they would hold nature to be holy if they fear it so much. They are also pluralists and a theocratic as well. Their holy sites are the same as the original one, Sophocus, Abduin's Glory, and the Great Library. Next we have the slaves of the God of Pain, who believe the world was made by the malevolent god Ashradamin Bashitan al Atelam, who tore off his own flesh to make plants, ground his bones to dust to make soil and its minerals, lit himself on fire to create animals, tore out his own heart to make man, and with his spine constructed Sophocus and the other spires of war at the other towers. Having sacrificed essentially all of himself to his creations, he gave humanity but one commandment, to go forth and slaughter. It is through this suffering that Ashrid can be regenerated and made whole once more, which is pretty sick. Some slaves say that Ashrid was worshipped long ago by another race who were slain, and in the wake of their demise, the world was punished severely. It is therefore up to all, including the slaves, to suffer in order to appease this fierce god. They believe in monasticism, asceticism, and the exaltation of pain. Monasticism simply means that they live in monastic cultures, or monastic holdings. Asceticism means that they find materialistic pursuits blinding to the divine truth, only by devoting themselves to simple lives without luxury can they achieve spiritual enlightenment plays into monasticism and the exaltation of pain. They find pain of either themselves or others to be holy. That one should make sense. They worship the god of pain. And they have the same holy sites as most of the other ones. The Erbadit al-Hukadir believe the world and all its creation came into being from a swirling maelstrom known as the Fauhada, not from any intelligent hand, but by chance. Man was chief among these creations, but without a being to worship, they sought to create their own gods. Yet, Initially they failed, but then came Kubal, the first vampire, who successfully made himself into a god, and with his gift taught others how to achieve godhood. With his kin, the first vampires ruled over the empire of Sophocus. They believe that all mortals have the potential to achieve godhood, and that all gods likewise were once as they are now. They believe in tax the non-believers, astrology, and human sacrifice. So astrology, that one makes sense. They believe that the world came out of a maelstrom in space, so of course they worship astrology. Human sacrifice. Again, if they worship vampires, they would of course worship that. Tax the non-believers. I didn't mention that in the thing, but basically in order to not be sacrificed, you have to pay a blood tithe or money. So they tax 
basically anybody so that they don't kill them. They're also pluralist and theocratic and worship the same holy sites as most of the other ones. The cult of the monoliths was founded by the adventurer King Hassan al kur in 727 IS. They worship three white monoliths engraved with unintelligible and intricate markings found in Jubal Khor. Hassan claimed these monoliths gave commandments to the most faithful when smeared with blood and ritual bloodletting quickly turned it to sacrifices to the monoliths for the sake of this wisdom. Some say they whisper and it becomes more audible the more blood and flesh is offered to them. Followers of the cult believe the monoliths are the head of a three-headed god, life and death, who was the first of all beings to ascend the thousand and one steps and became king of the gods. They worship reincarnation, ritual hospitality, and human sacrifice. Reincarnation, again self-explanatory, they believe that when they die they are reborn again on this earth. Ritual hospitality we've talked about before and human sacrifice as well. They are also pluralist, but unlike most of the other ones, they have lay clergy, meaning that they think that anybody, no matter what position, can preach their religious doctrine. They worship the same holy sites as most of the other ones. The Hayawan are one of the unique ones. They believe that long ago only a lion, or only lion specifically, mightiest of all beasts, existed on Eris. But with a fierce roar, man emerged from the soil, and lion was no longer alone. Then came hound, who guarded the dead and warriors alike. But lion and hound came to hate one another as Lion had no care for its creation. The two were on the verge of battling, but Lynx, another deity, tricked Lion into inviting Hound into his home. See where this is going? Since the whole of Eris was Lion's home, as its original inheritor, they were bound by the rules of hospitality. Lion and Hound became his brothers forever. They worship esotericism, ritual hospitality, and ritual celebrations. Nothing to really add. They actually only worship the holy sites of Sophocus and Abdubin's glory. They do not worship the Great Library, which kind of makes sense considering they're very grounded, origin story. The Eremites believe in the seven-headed serpent, who is both black as pitch but covered in gold and gems, sparkling like a thousand stars. They believe she will come to those most worthy, although as to what specifically she will offer them for their worthiness remains unclear. They believe in esotericism, the inner journey, and ritual celebration, and are pluralist and the theocratic as well. Not a whole lot about this one. The inner journey basically just means that only by understanding one's own self can we understand the world. Essentially, you have to go on meditative paths to understanding enlightenment. Basically, the serpent is supposed to to appear outside of a city of some sort and you'll be safe inside of it, but it also grants blessings. I was kind of confused by this one. Somebody could probably clarify a little bit further, maybe in the comments for me. This one was a, this one was a bit of a doozy. Our 10th sect, if you can believe it already, the Kamayed believe the thousand and one steps of Sophocus are a real place, but not the ones at the Great Tower, as is usually described, but instead are somewhere beyond the North Stars. And rather than rise, descend into a great crater there. They believe this crater is the doorway to the afterlife, and only those worthy enough to reach the bottom may enter into the realm of the gods. Their tenets are esotericism, literalism, and ritual celebration. Literalism just means that they're religious religious law is taken at absolute face value. There is no need for human interpretation. They are likewise theocratic and pluralist. These next couple, if I'm not mistaken, sort of deviate on the idea of where or what Sophocus is. And I find that fascinating, but but as you've noticed, most of them, aside from a couple like the Hayawan or the ones who worship the you know the god of pain or the worm cult, a lot of them do have Sophocus as their core main belief system, which I find uh, quite cool. Our next sect, the Mautau Moon and In, believe that beyond mortality there is only an entity of death, but rather than fear this inevitability, they crave it, long for it. They hold that since death is eternal. All gods and men must bow before it, and therefore is above all others worthy of veneration. They believe in esotericism, inner journey, and a unique one, the quest for death. The quest for death is, when you cast aside the illusions designed to mislead us, it becomes clear that the purpose of all life is to die. What is the value of such an ephemeral, pitiful existence before the immensity of death? Basically, they wish to join in the chorus of never-ending death. As you can see, they also have a couple unique virtues like melancholic, injured, maimed. They love that stuff. They want you to die. And they also find whole of body to be a sin. Normally, I wasn't going to mention those, but I do like that those are added in there. I, this one's quite interesting. They also worship the same holy sites as most of the other sects. The tribe of angels was founded by Sarah bint Shakira, who, upon climbing the thousand and one steps, found the angels at the top horrible to behold, sort of like biblically accurate angels, and that when they spoke, their voices were enough to drive one to madness and convulsions. Those who accompanied her to the top reported this finding as well, but to Sarah alone the angels delivered their message, that all faiths and gods of the world were but visages or masks of the angels, all paths to their eventual enlightenment. They charged Sarah with delivering peace to humanity, and bringing an end to the conflict between the ritualists and warden knights, whereupon she and her followers took up their metaphorical doves and white flags in pursuit of this end. Their core tenets are ritual hospitality, ancestor worship, and ritual celebration. We've talked about two of those before. Ancestor worship essentially just means that they worship their ancestors. That one's pretty normal from the base game. If they feel like these tenets should be a little different for this one. I don't know if they necessarily align all the way, considering they're trying to bring peace. 
but what can you do? Our next faith is probably the biggest of the ritualist faiths, and that's the Sophicists. They believe that the memorization and performance of the symbolic divine rites are the true thousand and one steps, and that the physical steps are merely where those lessons were passed down. The steps themselves are capable of being done anywhere, and through their performance can one understand the secret of the gods and achieve enlightenment. They believe in esotericism, the inner journey, and ritual celebration. Again, these are like the main, this is like the main sect if that sort of thing existed. Ritualism doesn't really have a core sect as you've seen, but they are sort of like the biggest one. And I believe the only ritualist ruler left in the game is also a sophicist. Their holy sites are Sophocus, Adubin's Glory, and the Great Library. Again, the same as all the other ones. The Suleimani follow the teachings of Magi philosopher Suleiman the Wise, who preached that the Sophocus on Eris was merely a manifestation of the true Sophocus found deep under the ground within the caverns of Doma Daniyal. Remember we mentioned that earlier? They believe that in ancient times, men were blessed with great stature and wisdom, capable of manipulating the physical world around them, but that over time, their size and wisdom decreased and degenerated into magic, becoming dangerous and evil. Those who held on to their wisdom and size, known as the Banu Daniyal, fled beneath Eris to the true Sophocus, while their kin above turned into man. Suleimani believe philosophy is the key to divinity and all philosophers incarnates of the divine past on Eris. Their core tenets are adaptive, esotericism, and inner journey. Adaptive basically just means that they are willingly taking in other ideas. They don't shun them or anything. They still are pluralist and theocratic and worship the same holy sites as most of the other ones. The next sect, this one is probably one of my favorite ones. The Tariq is the Road of the One. It was founded by the prophetess Hana who was born under Ward Knight rule, though she was herself a ritualist. As a result of living among Ward Knights, however, she grew to understand and sympathize with their cause, which you'll sort of see with their tenets and beliefs. Upon her ascension to the Thousand and One Steps, Hannah was warned that the physical world was the creation of a malevolent god and that those who worship such a god must be destroyed at all opportunities. Only by their destruction could mortals be free of their physical existence and ascend to the eternal garden of life. Hannah also preached of the One, who they claimed to be the one and only God. The One had once commanded ritualists to slay the followers of the evil God, but that their failure or misinterpretation forced the One to grant its wisdom to the first warden instead, and thus abandon the ritualists. Hannah claimed that if ritualists followed her teachings and followed the road of the One, or a list of laws reportedly given to her by the One, then the one would once again favor the ritualists. Their core tenets are legalism, inner journey, and peace in heaven, two unique ones that we have here. Legalism as our laws are the result of generations of wisdom and devotion, and adherence to them is by its very nature pious. A sinner, no matter who, will never be above the law. This is sort of taken from Wardenism, which is a faith basically based around law, so that's probably a nod to that. She also has justice as one of their virtues, as well as jurist. So again, Ward Knight sympathies sort of coming into a ritualist faith, which is why I like it. It's sort of the blending of both ideas. Peace in heaven, while it's not the defining struggle of our faith, there is much wrong in the world that clearly must be caused by some kind of dark entity. We should learn from the Ward Knights so that we too can preserve the pillars of virtue that keep the dead God contained. So essentially she, again, is combining Ward Knight and ritualist beliefs. And as a result of that, they have the most holy sites out of all of the ritualist sects. They have the original three, but they also have the Isle dungeon where the first warden was imprisoned and where he wrote his initial text mamor of the center or where the ward tonight head of faith lives and heathens tears i'm not exactly sure what that one is though unfortunately so if somebody wants to clarify that in the comments they certainly can that one i that one i wasn't really able to find anything about the west strozen following the teachings of naza the great claimed that sophocus was not a real place but a song with 1001 notes each rising upwards in pitch she believed that the mastery of this song would grant one enlightenment and that magi drew their power from this knowledge, consciously or otherwise, of some of those mystical notes. All music is unsurprisingly considered holy to these people, and musicians and those that seek to become one are regarded as pious. This is sort of like the Mogawai faith, which we will actually be talking about soon in Demoda. They believe that the Most High was a deity that is now dead, but also basically sang to speak, so music is essentially a holy form of speech. Those West Strozen believe in struggle and submission, inner journey, and ritual celebration. And struggle and submission is basically just just that the divine will is the source of all good, so a good existence is based on submission to that will expressed through the struggle to enact it. Basically, they struggle to follow this law that has been passed down to them. They worship the holy sites of Sophocus, Audubon's Glory, the Great Library, and Geminam, which again, this one I couldn't find really anything about, but it's a island that looks to belong to Warden Knights at the moment. And we've at long last reached the end of our sects. We have the Fellowship of Karim, founded by the Prophet Karim ibn Sophocus, who was himself an illiterate and uneducated man who lived within sight of the tower, argued that priesthood stood in opposition of the teachings of Sophocus. 
that anyone regardless of station or intellect should and could be a prophet. By extension, Karim believed that the notion of priest kings, high priests, or god kings was an abomination, and that any organized priesthood could only work to oppress or water down the true message of Sophocles. Though this does not in fact mean that the sects shun priesthood itself or those who would preach of this sect, but rather believe that anyone regardless of their station is worthy of that title. Essentially, they believe in lay clergy, which of course is in their main doctrine. However, all priests or prospective ones are expected to make the journey of the thousand and one steps once in their lifetime and those who enter the station should oppose the codification or organization of their faith to the death if necessary. As I mentioned, they have mandatory pilgrimage. I think there might be the only one that did out of this whole list. I'm actually wrong. They were not the only one out of the whole list. The the ones from the Pirate Coast also had mandatory pilgrimage, which I don't think I mentioned at the time, but I'm mentioning it now, so there you go. Their core tenets are communal identity, adaptive, and ritual celebrations, which we've discussed all of those before. And they likewise worship the same holy sites as most of the other ones. And that, at long last, is the end of this telling. So we've covered 17 subfaiths. I hope I didn't get anything jumbled. You know, I try my hardest to keep all of my notes as neat and organized as possible, but you really never know what's this sort of thing. There's so much to keep track of. I can't even imagine how I'm going to do the adversarian when I feel like I'm going to have to break it into two videos. 27 subfaiths is an insane amount to cover. But, you know, I'll happily do it when we get to that point. But that is going to be it for this one. I hope that you guys liked this one. The Ritualists are quite an interesting faith. I think some of these faiths probably need a little more fleshing out, but other ones I really enjoyed. I like the one that's a mix of Wardenite and Ritualism, which I don't even think I can pronounce correctly. Oh, the Road of the One, that one I really enjoy. And then I also like the one, the Cult of the, the Worm, basically. That's really awesome. I mean, I love Dune, so I couldn't, how could I not enjoy that? But anyway, thank you so much for watching. If you like this sort of video, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, as it lets me and YouTube know that you like this sort of content, you'd like to see more of it. If you enjoy God Herja videos and you enjoy the God Herja mod, consider supporting the dev team on Patreon or just consider joining their Discord and chatting them up. They're very nice and they would love to have you. If you like my content, you'd like to support it, you consider becoming a channel member. We have two membership tiers. You get a couple little fun emotes and then, you know some other perks like early video access and other things, but you can check those out. There's only two tiers in the join tab. And that's it for me. Thank you so, so much for watching. I'm Sol. This has been Fates of Eris Ritualism. I can't believe we've already done three of these already. I have another one coming up, which is going to be about the Mogawai, which should come out in a couple weeks. And I hope you enjoy that one as well. But thank you. I'm Sol, and I will happily see you in the next one.